Live from Las Vegas, Nevada, it's theCUBE. Covering Knowledge15, brought to you by ServiceNow. Okay, welcome back everyone. We are here live in Las Vegas. This is Silicon Angle and Wikibon's The Cube, our flagship program. We go out to the events and extract the ceiling from the noise. I'm John Furrier with my co-host, Dave Vellante, David Smoley, CIO AstraZeneca. Welcome to The Cube. Thank you. Thank so you tell us, um, um, you're at the CIO decision just came down. John Cleese was talking. He's going to come on The Cube later. Uh, we're going to interview him, see how he goes. Uh, but the, the creativity was this, the theme of his speech and uh, as CIO, being strategic is about being creative. <laughs> we is. heard that before. Yeah. So tell us, what's going on with you right now? Tell us about the business you're involved in as CIO, mm -hmm. and uh, just a quick, quick overview, and we can go into some of the questions. Okay. Yeah, so AstraZeneca, I think we're the seventh largest pharmaceutical company globally. We're, we're the most global of the pharmaceuticals. We do business in over 100 countries. We're about 26 billion in sales. And um, we are, like many of the pharmas, uh, dealing with tremendous pressure as many of our major blockbuster drugs come off patent, so we have to look for new uh, sources of revenue. Uh, there's also a lot of pressure from governments around the rising cost of healthcare, so they're looking at reducing the amount of money that we spend. Um, and what we've done at AstraZeneca is we've gone back to focus on the science. So we have uh, invested heavily in drug development We've spent about $5 billion a year on research. We've got about 10,000 scientists in six countries. And so we're, we're very focused on building the pipeline of molecules. The areas we focus on are cardiovascular, respiratory, uh, immunology. And so uh, the other thing that's quite interesting is science is changing with the rise of the biologics. So traditionally, pharma companies did small molecules, which are chemicals, and increasingly, we're investing more in biologics, which are sort of proteins derived from live cells. So flu vaccine comes from eggs, basically, and the specific cells that are manufactured to deliver these um, uh, transport mechanisms, which is what biologics are. And now we're looking at combining the small molecule and the large molecule into these new combinations, which target very specific illnesses and diseases. So really, really exciting time to so be. So you got in operational, you got a lot of R and D, which you know you guys try to keep the patents, you know, from going to market until the last minute. Right. So a lot of IT involved, a lot of strategic assets. Yeah. Not yeah. just hey, make sure the computers are provisioned and people have access to the applications. Really mission critical, pretty much across the board. It is a challenge in all that. Very diverse. I mean, you know, it's exciting. On the, on the science side, there's a, a lot of, uh, of big data and analytic problems. I mean, obviously, um, testing drugs in, is in animals and in humans is expensive and time consuming. So the more you can do it in silica through simulations, um, that's kind of the future, compressing the cycle times. On the other end of the spectrum, sales, we've got, you know, 30,000 sales folks around the world, including 6,000 in China making them mobile enabled, giving these guys the tools they need so they can get in and out with the doctors and the payers. And then you've got the whole supply chain and enabling in between. So lots of different IT challenges. Um, it's an exciting time. Yeah, I mean, I call it hurting, hurting the cats at Big Pharma. Yeah. You got you know big R&D engine, like you said before, high risk. You got to get stuff you know out of R&D into the pipeline, which you know <laughs> we're in Vegas. It's a lot of it's a crapshoot. Um, but you, you increase the probability of a, of, of a blockbuster uh, and then when you get the blockbuster, you're under tremendous pressure. You got generics coming in, governments, you know, beating on you. You're, you're regulated to the point where your legal, count, your general counsel is like, no, don't do that, don't do this. Right. You got the, your job, you're, you're balancing risk and reward, you know, right. constantly. So, and you came from Flextronics, right? Correct. Uh, so, sort of a, you mentioned you live in Silicon Valley. So a little bit now you're in, 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 in London. Right. A little different world. So talk about that whole, yeah. you know, change in your, yeah, it's, it's exciting. I mean, it's both frustrating and exciting. So, uh, but I think it's, it's a fabulous opportunity for, for a lot of industries like this um, because the pharma industry has is, is, um, been very focused on, on sort of inward looking and a uh, very tightly networked group of people and they, they're quite collaborative. Um, but until recently, they haven't looked as much outside the industry. And so right now, I think um, there's a great opportunity to look at other industries and, and figure out you know, about doing the impossible. So the exciting opportunity for me is to come in from a very speed-oriented industry and 
look at many of the things that people who who've been raised in pharma or raised in AstraZeneca take as a given. They don't challenge them, uh, and to come in and, and sort of ask why not, you know, why why are we doing things this way, and push the boundaries. And so um, it's been exciting to bring some of that radical thinking in, stir the pot a little bit, and then of course. Technology is changing so fast, you know, with companies like ServiceNow, these cloud-oriented companies are totally changing the paradigm of, of the cost it takes to get up and running, the speed, the different uh, future, you know, roadmap and evolution of new technology. So it's, it's a really exciting time. So what are some of the interesting things you've worked on since coming to AstraZeneca that you would consider transformative? Well, we've, I mean, we've had two key thrust, I guess, to our IT strategy. One is around insourcing. Um, so we were about 70% outsourced to third parties. We had eight different third party vendors that were helping us in our IT ecosystem and it was, it was very complex. There were a lot of handoffs um, and a lot of waste. So we've been very focused on bringing that work in and simplifying it and cleaning it up. And the other is uh, we're pushing very hard into cloud and mobile. And so, you know, in the last year, we've gone live with ServiceNow, Viva, which is, you know, for the Salesforce. We've gone cloud with Office 365 for mail. Uh, we've implemented Box, for Document Store, DocuSign. We went live on ServiceNow. Um, we have, I'm trying to think what the others are. So, multiple cloud solutions that have been, have been implemented, given us tremendous speed, and at the same time, you know, all these tools are available on mobile devices. So as we push to that sort of any device anywhere approach where you know the, the primary question is hey can I access it on my iPhone or my Samsung device um, and then the secondary question is oh by the way can I also look at it on a tablet or on my laptop and so those sorts of things are transformative because it, it makes uh, doing work much easier. It's interesting, you mentioned, if I heard right, since you're insourcing 70% of your activity was outsourced. Correct. Um, and then you brought it back in-house to make it more efficient, get more control. I thought that right. was the whole idea of outsourcing. Right, right, right. It didn't work out so well. Well, you know, the, the pendulum swings <laughs> a bit. Um, I think if you if you go back 10 years ago, you know, the early 2000s, um, there was a, the, the du jour strategy was to outsource, right? And so a lot of companies went big that way. And I think the thinking, which at the time was logical, was, um, you know, we're, we're not an IT company, we're a drugs yeah. company. My so mess for less. Yeah, I'll give it to it somebody out. else, an, an IBM or, yeah. or Cognizant or whoever, right. they'll take care of it. But the reality is that, that these guys, you know, they're in the business to make money for themselves, not to make money for you. So, um, and, and if you don't manage it carefully and if you uh, set it up incorrectly and so on, then you find that you're, you're, not, uh, you're not very efficient. And in our case, uh, you know, we, we had eight different vendors that were involved in a system. So if you think about doing an, uh, an incident remediation on a, on a system failure, and you'd have to get eight different companies in the room or on the phone to figure out what happened and then troubleshoot. It's, it's, it's incredibly painful. Yeah. So we had to clean that up. So I know you're in the CIO decisions sort of tracks. Uh, right. today, but uh, I probably had an opportunity to see the keynotes this morning. Yeah, right? absolutely. Okay. So big theme was productivity, yeah. email hell. I said, tweeted out, Frank Slootman's made a career out of you know selling aspirin and painkiller, and uh, he's <laughs> found some pain. So I, I, as a CIO, I wonder, you know, what are your thoughts on what you heard this morning in terms of some of the data that was shown? You know, two out of five days are spent on admin tasks. Um, that sort of email description that Frank put forth, is that sort of reflective of what's going on in organizations yeah, today? Absolutely. I think it is probably more than, than we realize. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I think uh, obviously, you know, Frank is uh, promoting the, the platform and, and the, the sort of the service uh, process uh, capabilities, which are very powerful. And, and we've certainly found, so I've implemented ServiceNow at two companies now, and in each case, is, the productivity was transformative. And, and some of that comes from getting all the different players on a single source of truth, a single source of data, and then following common processes. And that's extremely powerful. And when you think about the global, the scalability, the multi-language, um, it's, it's, it's very, very helpful. So, you know, what I see today was ServiceNow and Frank just kind of going the next logical step, which is to say, look, if you can do it for an IT service desk, why can't you do it for facilities? Why can't you do it for finance? Why? There are so many um, processes that are critical for a business to run. Um, and when you have a tool like that that creates that speed and enablement, it's easy to use. 
the, the IT department knows how to configure it, so you can pretty quickly respond in an agile method to solving problems. And ServiceNow came in under your watch, or was it? Yeah, yeah, yeah okay. So, so we, we brought it in uh, about seven years ago at, at Flextronics. Um, super, super successful there. And then this past year we implemented AstraZeneca, so we're, we're up now running it and uh, across globally and inside and outside. So these service partners, you know, the Cognizance and Emphasis yep. of the world, they're on the same instance of service now. So we're all singing from the same yeah. songbook. It started with the ITSM? Correct. Sort of change yeah. management? Yeah, ITIL based, yep. Okay, and, and are you running a single CMDB at this point? Or? We are, yeah, we're running a single CMDB. We're, you know, that's a, uh, a continuous improvement initiative. So we're just, we made some pretty big investments this past year in, in a lot of tools to allow us to monitor and collect data and things like that. There's actually a lot of really cool new technology, you know, companies like Tanium, which uh, are able to scan the network, um, give you real-time intelligence around uh, devices, configurations, things like that. Tools like Sky High Networks, which en enable you to actually see what's happening with usage patterns, internet surfing, things yeah. like that. So. Real and, powerful and, stuff. And, and are you now, are you in the process of, or are you thinking about where, where you're at in terms of extending it into other businesses? You know, we've heard a lot about HR and yeah. facilities and marketing and finance. Yeah, so uh, we we already have the finance shared services is using it, and uh, and as well as facilities. Um, I think we're, we're just going live on Workday in uh, May, and you know, Workday is a HR tool. Yeah. Um, I, that will be the platform for a lot of change in, in our HR operations. So I, I think, you know, we've got the tool now and we're able to pace with the business and the business has got an initiative around how do we simplify things and I think it'll be, a, it'll be an obvious choice for us as we look at cleaning up some of those different David, areas. David, talk about the changing role of the, of the CIO, obviously in IT shifting so much. Yeah. Just go back 10 years ago when you mentioned companies like Search now being highly successful, right. certainly productivity. Um, as an executive dealing with vendors and suppliers, having business outcomes on one side, managing yeah. the relationships on another, it's really important mm -hmm. to get the value. Mm -hmm. so talk about what's different in the past 10 years on the purchasing decisions, the platform decisions, the personnel decisions. You know, I was talking to Frank Slootman earlier about the his sailing analogy, and it's like, you know, because he sails boat, crew, conditions. Yeah. Similar executive uh, concepts that the CIO deals with. 10 years ago, much different timetables mm -hmm. to get, you know, upfront licenses, huge integration costs, and then you kind of, there's a time period to kind of get to a point where you go, uh, you got there, or you did, or you didn't, you didn't like it, some people love it. Some, so what's changed as you make these decisions yeah. as an executive? Well, you hit on it right there. I think the number one thing that has changed the most is the cycle time, the speed. I mean, it's the, both on the demand side of what people's expectations are, and on the delivery side. So cloud has given us incredible flexibility and agility and speed in our ability to deliver. So, you know, they, Frank talked today about how um, just for this conference, they set up 40,000 instances yeah, of service now. On, on AWS. On AWS <laughs> in, in like hours, right? And two people manage it. I mean, that's just, awesome. that's nuts. It's right? like that scene in Monty Python, the Holy Grail, the three questions. You know, can you support cloud? <laughs> yes, okay, <laughs> next. <laughs> <laughs> can you support mobile? <laughs> the airspeed, I'm a swallow. <laughs> yeah. I don't know. Um, <laughs> I think we even the John Cleese, so he'll be on later. Um, thank you. But in a way, there should be that kind of global consumption contract we've heard from other the CIOs um, who's been on theCUBE, yeah. that there's a global now contract from a consumption standpoint, and there are some table stakes. In right. all serious now, what is what are some of those table stakes well, for a consumption contract? You know, and, it, and it's on both sides, right? So it's sort of increased opportunity as well as increased risk. Um, I mean, one of the things that's changed dramatically, obviously you read about it every day, is the whole cyber security angle, right? Which, by the way, is enabled by the internet and the cloud and all yeah. these things. I mean, the, the way these guys can be so yeah incredibly uh, aggressive and creative in how they're attacking companies is because of uh, some of the technology evolution. So, you know, that's... That Casey earlier said, you know, the post-Snowden era, yeah. the data piece, just that piece is interesting. Oh, it's crazy. It's crazy, so that's something, I mean, there's real risk there, right, for companies and for, for individuals leading. So, you have to be, um, very, very much on top of that, and it's moving so fast, I mean, no one, no one knows. You, you know, they used to say, there were two companies, you know, companies that had been hacked and companies that were going to be hacked. 
now it's kind of like there's two companies. There's companies that know they've been hacked and companies that have been hacked but don't know they've been yeah. hacked, right? Yeah. So that's it's a just, quote, yeah, that's totally true. Yeah, so so kind of staying ahead of that is is kind of the defensive part, I guess. You know, on the other side, there's just so much opportunity and you know, I think the, the companies and the teams and the CIOs who go for those opportunities aggressively are going to have competitive There's a lever of, it, of the opportunity. The lever there is you can move the ball down the field, big yeah. time. Yeah. But the risk is the security. With the perimeter going away, how do you deal with that? Is it cryptography? Is it, um, you know, virtualization? Yeah. I mean, you must be, that must be a t a t one of the top conversations you have. It, it is. I mean, I think the the posture of most companies is is more offensive and less defensive these days. I mean, not in an attacking sense, but. You know, I think people are beginning to uh, recognize you cannot operate Wait. with walls and moats anymore. You mean not waiting for an incident or a breach? Being exactly. more proactive in the pattern recognition That's right. and That's do right. your best. I mean, increasingly the assumption is you, you are breached, you're going to be breached. So you can't keep them out. But what you can do is keep them from leaving with anything of value yeah. and stop them. So how do you how do one you One of the early it? employees of Illumio, one of the hot startups in Silicon Valley, just got $100 million in funding, yeah. only a couple of years old, they said there's no more lock and key at the front door, it's right. a thousand soldiers right. inside the company around the apps. Do you do you believe in that philosophy? Do you see it that way? Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely, and again, I think, I think so the, the key is, you know, what assets do you need to watch, what individuals do you need to watch? How are you looking at anomalies and behavior, um, pattern recognition, those sorts of things, so that you can you know, move in quickly with the right you know, assets, the right uh, mitigating factors to, to solve things. So I got to ask you the question on the, because um, your CIO, a little bit biased, but not, it always comes up, because it's always kind of like a jump ball at this point, depending on who you talk to. The CISO is a new role. Should that report to the CIO, some say? Some say it should report to the CEO. Both dotted lines. Um, the chief information security officer, obviously RSA is going on in San Francisco right now. It's a big right. debate. Right. You know, things like that. And things like, you know, reporting um, breaches and incidents or yeah. incidents yeah, yeah, yeah. to share other with other companies. What's your philosophy on both those concepts? You know, I think reporting relationships are overrated, right? So, so the answer is it depends. And the most important thing is not the reporting relationship, but it's the effectivity of the individual. So, so in my case, I have a CISO who reports to my head of infrastructure and ops. So he's actually uh, one level down from me. Um, however, I know that guy really well. In fact, we worked together at previous companies. We have he's a very, like a lieutenant, but he's close to the action. He's close to the action. He, he deals with the audit committee at the board level. He deals with the CEO. He deals with, with me. And so he's able to navigate, negotiate, you know, work with the individuals. He's got great relationships outside the company. What, what's most important with CISOs these days is, do they have the right relationships with government, with um, you know, third-party experts, with other CISOs, so that they're sharing information to kind of, you so know. So what you're saying, better. if I translate, politics doesn't really matter when life's on the line with security because you right. want to get the job done, so it doesn't really matter where you are it's pretty hot position. <laughs> I mean, I think so. I think the question is, you know, are you effective? Do you have the information you need? Do you have the resources you need? Yep. And are you able to make the decisions without dealing, you know, without getting slowed down? And by so, the way, same same for the CIO, right? So when you think about the remediation pie for security, we've heard yeah. ServiceNow talk about some new security apps and capabilities. Where does that fit in relative to, I mean, you mentioned two types of companies, those that act, those that have and don't know it. Right. It's, I don't know, what the stat, 250 days before you realize there's been an intrusion? Yeah, yeah, you know, yeah. Okay, so in thinking about spending more money, not just on the perimeter, protecting the perimeter, but f f figuring out where the hacks are coming from and other remediation you know, techniques, mm -hmm. how much of a difference can ServiceNow and technologies like ServiceNow make, in your opinion? Just one arrow in the quiver, or is it a big chunk of the no, it's, it's huge um, because it's knowledge, right? So it's data. What, what ServiceNow gives you is uh, a repository and, and a series of, of processes for effectively understanding a situation. Now, you know, as far as security specifically, um, it's one part of the, the story. So you need other tools of course, yeah. to collect you know, security data and to mitigate and so on. But, what that becomes is a bit of the, they're calling it the ERP of IT. You know, it's sort of 
where you go to, to understand your devices, where you go to understand the key processes and people and, and deal with them. So All visibility, right. really. Right. Absolutely. Dave, we really appreciate Fast taking the time. Decisions. I just did a tweet, Insight Alert, because that was a really awesome uh, candid answer on the, great answer on the CISO, and just overall great, great insight. Thanks for great, taking yeah. the time. I'll give you the final word here, get your thoughts in the segment on um, what is everything as a service to you as a CIO? I put the marketing you know, stuff aside. It is good marketing. I got to hand it the service now on that. Um, it does imply where we're going, basically cloud. Right. But what does that mean to you as you move that into practical terms into your organization? What the hell does everything as a service mean? You know, uh, I, translate that for us into like uh, you know practical execution terms for you, as CIO. Well, for me, service is important. I, I'm coming into an environment which was probably overly emphasizing the service and not enough emphasizing the performance and the uh, technology. So, so I'm sort of in AstraZeneca. We're downplaying the service a little bit to focus on technology leadership, operational excellence, customer focus simplification, collaboration, those kinds of Foundational things. Foundational-like services? Foundational stuff, yeah. So, so the service itself simply says, look, you're going to do a piece of work, you've got a customer, right? So there's a piece of work, you got inputs and you got outputs, and you got to be real clear on what those are and where the boundaries start and stop and how you're going to measure it. That's, that's what service you heard is. The, you you might have heard the buzzword, um, that's been keyed around Silicon Valley right now, it's pretty hot, microservices. Right. Um, what the hell does that mean? A part of a service? Is it more <laughs> app-driven? Is it more, because you hear it more in the DevOps on the edge app side. Right, um, right. What does that mean to you? Well, I, I honestly hadn't thought about it. I don't know, but what I, would, what I assume it means is, again, you know, um, as we bring dev and ops more closely together, you know, you're able to decompose into smaller pieces. It's much more modular. Yeah. You're, you're able to actually move parts and pieces around. Yeah, so. you, Docker container, these are the new trends about interoperability. I think that's where they're trying to, it's exactly. getting some traction. It's a little bit of Kool-Aid phase yeah. right now, but uh, you know, implied services. Yeah, yeah. David, th Dave, thanks for just coming out on theCUBE. Really appreciate it. Smalley, the CIO here inside theCUBE, sharing the data with you, extracting the signal from the noise here at ServiceNow Live in Las Vegas. We're on day one of three days of wall-to-wall -wall coverage, Dave. We got a lot more coming. This is theCUBE. I'm John Furrier with Dave Vellante. Go to siliconangle.tv, go to crowdchat.net slash no15 for all the conversations. Join the conversations. Uh, we'll be right back after the, after the short break. <laughs>